Hello. Hello. And welcome to Finish, Finish Big. Big. I'm Mark. And I'm Joe. <laughs> and we are jaunting our way. We're doing what? We're jaunting. Does that mean wanking? No. Oh. Uh, it's what the tomorrow people do. Ah, because when they're we, breaking out. Yes, yes, we're jaunting here to talk about the Tomorrow People Ooh. as we work our way through yeah. all of the many big Finnish releases and ranges that they have had in the past. Is this the most niche range that Big Finish does? Well, it's difficult to say no, because I, oh, it's no. not available anymore. So, Tales like, of new, new whatever Earth. we're talking about, we could talk about anything about in these. No one's going to know because no one's heard them and they can't hear them. Do you think that's the nichest Tales what is, of New New Earth? That's not niche, that's not true. No, but it's it's sort of an offshoot of an offshoot of an offshoot. Look, no, let's just not let's just talk about the tomorrow people. Okay. <laughs> Fine. I've so got plenty to say about them as so well. So it's the second series that we're yeah. talking about today. We and we're quite impressed with the first series. Because we'd never I mean, it, I hadn't really watched much Tomorrow People before we did that first series, but we really no. enjoyed it. It was lots of fun. Yes. I'm coming to the conclusion. Because we did watch Tomorrow People ahead of doing the first series, didn't we? We watched the Jedekiah ones and A Man for a Million, things like this. And we were so spectacularly unimpressed by the TV ones that the audios could do nothing but impress us. Yeah, and but they it, did. Well, that first series did. This yes. time round, it's a little <laughs> bit different. <laughs> Mixed, I'd say. Uh, so the stories we're talking about today are A New Atlantis... Those fools are in the nursery compared to me, if you'll pardon the pun. The power of fear. As a tomorrow person, I've seen many a spaceship like that. The curse of Kaven. Die, you evil bitch! <laughs> and alone. I'm going to do my best India fishing here. I spent so long psychoanalyzing my patients, I've become a right cynical old bitch. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, slightly different tone this time round. Yeah, a lot of uses of the word bitch. We have Nicholas Young returning as John. Mm -hmm. uh, so he's from the TV series. Yeah. We've got Philip Gilbert as Tim, also the vo voice of the computer in the Not TV series. Long, no. And then we've got our new... Specially created Big Finish Tomorrow People. Yeah. So, like so a hybrid, isn't it? Of the yeah, two. so that's Eleanor, played by Helen Goldwyn, and Paul, played by Daniel Wilson. If you will, if you are a fan of the Tomorrow People, I'm assuming one, you've heard these audios, but if you haven't, Eleanor is basically the new modern Kimmy Schmidt. <laughs> no, not Kimmy Schmidt. What's her name? <laughs> What's the character's name? Carol. Carol. You know, the one who's all doing the Katie Manning impressions yeah. all the time. Okay, oh, this oh, is no. This oh. ghastly place I found myself in. Quickly. Oh, help me. And Paul is like the new um, sort of Tyso, the tramp. No, not tramp. Uh, <laughs> gypsy. No. Tyso. Tyso and... He's not. He's... What was the name? Oh, Kenny. He's yeah, but he Kenny. reminds me of he's, he's a little Kenny. bit of a he's the Thomas Brewster of the Tomorrow People. I feel no. sometimes. Well, he sounds a bit like it. Every he's a bit like that, but a bit more annoying than Thomas Brewster. Of the Tomorrow People had an annoying child. Yeah, and he is our annoying child of the new like the Joker. modern Tomorrow yeah. People audios. Yeah, so that is our main cast over these four stories. Mm. But before we go in to the first story, uh, can I ask you a question, please? Of course. Who is this season, or who is this audio series geared at? Fans of the 1970s television programme, The Tomorrow People. Yeah, but how many people are those? Are they still around? Well, I don't know. It's, it's got a following. It's out on DVD. There's well, they fans of it. Well, five seasons. They were going to do more, so then, I'm assuming they were selling. Yeah, it's the same as the, you know, you watch Doctor Who as a kid and you're a fan of it now and you want to get the big Finnish audios. It's the same. I mean, it's a smaller market granted but it's out there isn't it and because we've had they're always trying to remake the tomorrow people you've got the 90s version you've got that american oh, version yes. and maybe these didn't sell as well i don't know i'm sure they probably didn't do audios of the 90s ones you know christian uh, who Smith, knows? yeah daniel tessier as yeah. a megabyte but so it's aimed at that audience which is the doctor who audience at the end of the day well i sort of went down a bit of a rabbit hole thinking about this whilst we were listening to this because i was like this sort of mixed bunch of audios based on this 1970s tv show like, who's buying this but you can still listen to them without watching the tv show like i did i it explains in series one and these are you could just keep 
listen to this as a sci-fi radio adventure. You don't need to know the TV series. Same with the Doctor Who's. Do you, Same think, with do you think these work better as Survivors. audios than on TV then? Because obviously on oh, audio I mean, they there's they no terrible. budget. I was so surprised watching that TV series because it is more of a children's show than Doctor Who. Yeah, it's How on a children's terrible budget, remember. It it's How got a young budget looked. though. I always thought Tomorrow People was a bit more towards Blake Seven sort of but i it like was, seven don't look great no but no but it was it just in the way it was made it was a bit more competent this was definitely children's television but these audios are not telling children's television stories well no but... with helen goldwood going get away you bitch <laughs> <laughs> yeah it can be a little more adult but no no no. my point was like are uh, are uh, were they trying to entice a new, you know, generation of children no, to listen to these not audios. Have this conversation? <laughs> no, eight-year-olds are not picking up the Tomorrow People audios. Eight-year-olds are not picking up the Doctor Who audios. This is for a different market, a fan but the, collector's don't market. Don't you think Big Finish would like to entice a new generation of children to be listening to their Tomorrow People audios? Well, they'd have to put out the Tomorrow People podcast redacted for the younger audience, I think. <laughs> Tomorrow People Redacted, that kind of thing. You're not going to get... I'm sorry, yeah. I don't know. You, every everybody, ticking, you, bring me, yeah. you bring me a seven or eight-year-old who's got a subscription to Big Finish. Well, <laughs> then, but, last thing. I'd like to run an experiment, please. If there are any Finnish Big Hoes out there with children... <laughs> don't make them listen to this, please. Please. We, yeah, I'm going to choose one at random. Let's just say the New Atlantis. Oh, God. A New Atlantis. Can you please ask your child to listen to a New <laughs> no. Atlantis before they go Ch- to bed? Children do not listen to Big Finish. And... Ask them afterwards if they want to listen to any more. I'm, <laughs> I w- I'm trying to see if there is like a possibility that Big Finish isn't just appealing to crusty old geeks like you and me. Even children don't listen to their Captain Scarlet or Thunderbirds once. I guarantee you no child has ever listened to those. So, what, there's adults listening to Captain Scarlet yeah, audios? I'm sure there are, yes. What a life. Well, you're going to get round to it eventually. Did I ever tell you about the time when the man invited me around his house? I, I met him on Grinder, and he invited me around his house, right, and he goes, I've got a surprise for you. And I thought, oh my God, I have a good night tonight. <laughs> He put on Thunderbirds DVDs. That was the surprise. He wanted to snog whilst we was watching Thunderbirds. <laughs> and he was a grown adult man. Well, he's probably got the audios as well. Mind you, you like to snog while watching Planet of the Daleks, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Right. Let's right. talk about the first story. No, no, but so you do you, do you think it's completely out then that... Big I finish. think it's very rare. Yeah, they're not like, let's make the Tomorrow People and loads of kids are going to buy it and it's going to be a huge sensation. It's for that niche market of Tomorrow People fans from the 70s. They want to hear Nicholas Young back in action doing and his imagine, thing. Imagine if they did, right, and you could have... You know, whatever the equivalent of Smash Hits magazine is right now, Helen Goldwyn <laughs> as Eleanor. You know, tell in us, Smash Hits tell magazine. Tell us all about Helen Eleanor. Goldwyn versus Martin McCutcheon <laughs> in the Divas. <laughs> <laughs> Question and answers. Oh, marvelous! <laughs> all right, fine. It's just for geeks. Let's go. A New Atlantis was released in April two thousand and three. Joining the regular cast, we've got Andrew Westfield, Carlos Riera, Nigel Fares. This was written by Nigel Fares and directed by Big Cheese, Big Bollocky Cheese Cheese, Jason A. Ellery. <laughs> and these are three 20 to 25 minute episodes. Yes. They all are in this I series. I want to talk about this. Okay. Because I don't think that we need cliffhangers in any of these stories. I think... Yeah, but you do that with the Doctor Who ones as well. What's the difference? They're the... trying to recreate the TV series. You let me speak, please. Okay. The difference between this and Doctor Who is Doctor Who is nearly two hours long. So to chop them up into four 30-minute segments makes perfect sense. No one wants to listen to a, a two-hour audio. But most of us have the attention span to be able to listen to a one-hour audio. That's what they do now most of the time. You don't need 20-minute segments. And forgive me. Nearly all of the cliffhangers, except for the ones where Helen Goldwyn was going around murdering people. I thought that was a good cliffhanger. All the cliffhangers here were just totally... It's basically just someone going, oh, my mind! Yeah, that happens I'm all having, the time! I'm having a psychic attack! Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, OK, so this is written by Nigel Fares. And we haven't done any of his other 
audios just yet, but he comes into the Doctor Who Companion Chronicles. He does that Leela trilogy, he, no, what, which he, I always found a little bit difficult. Nigel Fares has a particular style. Which is? Which I find difficult. It's If he was a prose writer, it would be more flowery and descriptive and big concepts. And that's what he tries to do in his audios here and in, in the Companion Chronicles. And I found it really difficult to follow. I, I think Nigel Fares is a talented man. When he, the Companion Chronicles started out, he was, I think, the creative overseer of those first two series. As a writer, I feel like he has a ton of ideas for each story and he doesn't know how to assemble it into a coherent plot. So he writes three stories this season. Two of them are sabotaged by the fact that he just can't be clear with his narrative. So you spend most of the story going, what's going on? It's so disappointing because we were really excited. And then this one, Eleanor's having a like bad dreams and seeing visions and stuff. Because well, that's if happened a lot. Like, if you're a tomorrow person, this is regular. You're always going to have psychic attacks, attacks <laughs> weird dreams, weird yeah. feelings. That's what you do. And it's always, my <laughs> mind, my dreams. <laughs> she is the Colin that's Baker like of <laughs> <laughs> tomorrow people. Every time, my mind. So she's doing that. Um, John is, what, off to the Canary Islands yeah, to find something about that? Basically, we don't even get to a new Atlantis. Or I don't know, because then Eleanor... She finds the guy in her dreams. She jaunts there and he's a statue. Then she touches the statue. Ah, my mind! End of part one. Okay. And then there's a painting. And then there's a man in a coma. And is she in love with the man in the coma or not? And what is John doing with that guy that sounds like he's from the rapture? What is it? I just completely lost the plot. There was just... I mean, this isn't the worst one. This is the easier one as well. Listening to you critique this story is like listening to the story. You're all over (laughs) the bloody place. It was just a lot. Will you fix on one point, please? And it's not explaining. And you can complain that in audios, it's a bit. It can be a bit over descriptive, and you can say, "Oh, this is happening here." Or look over there; there that person's doing that. Nothing. But there's none of wrong that. With it's gone the other way. Explaining what you're doing. It's gone the other way here. Along. So then you're like, actually, what is happening here? Because. I kept thinking, have we missed an episode? Because Eleanor's no, there with the guy, and then suddenly it. they're in a garden, or she's talking to so I just, yeah. I really couldn't tell you what was happening in this, and it was really tough. I feel like uh, you should feel like a, pro- a a plot is progressing in a linear fashion, and if it isn't progressing, and this was linear, because every story was taking place coherently, uh, co- concurrently, but because you, you cut back and forth to so many plot threads... You just can't get a handle on them at all. And because there isn't enough description within the scenes as to what was going on, it was just random stuff that seemed to be kicking off all the time. It was very confusing. I felt like, okay, picture this. I'm going to do a sort of, you talk about flowery metaphors. Here we go. A sheet of glass, yeah? That is Nigel Fair's plot. A sheet of glass from beginning to end. He lifts it above his head. And then throws it to the floor from a great height. Yeah? It shatters everywhere. It's like, oh no, my plot. What am I going to do? And then he tries to assemble it from all the shards on the floor. And this is <laughs> this is what you get as the finished audio release. It's all these weird plot, <laughs> plot points. All sort of told out of order in a very strange way. It's a it very wasn't a fun approach. one to start with, no. With his Companion Chronicles with Leela, you have, what is it, the Catalyst... Empathy, Empathy games, games and... The Time Vampire. They get progressively worse as they go along because he, this sort of starts slipping into his storytelling in the Companion Chronicles as well. This sort of throwing in lots of weird stuff and hoping it means something to you. Mm. And I just need a little more explanation yeah. and a little less ambiguity. Was there anything good in this one, though, that yes. you liked? There was. There was a brilliant idea in this. And this is another issue this season is he keeps bringing up brilliant ideas and doing them as a throwaway reference rather than actually focusing on the idea itself. So he talks about the psychic souls of the Atlanteans being trapped in the relics of the city, you know, um, and that those are sort of coming to life. That's a really interesting idea. It's a spooky idea. Don't do nothing with it at all. No. That was the one good thing I wrote I, down. The, um, the fella who Eleanor's talking to in his mind is called David, who 
dies in a coma. So was at he, the end I was of like, is story. he dead or is he not? Is she psychically talking? Is he actually there? Is he coming out of this painting? Yeah, see. Is he real? Like, I, I don't like, think any I'm of that's just, explained. It just wasn't clear enough. No. So then your mind, your imagination, when you're trying to picture what's going your on. Mind. It, my mind, my mind, I was having a psychic <laughs> issue with this one. It's like, what is happening? I was like picturing her jumping through a painting or something, but I don't think that actually happened. I don't know. I did write down, um, is there sexual chemistry between Paul and Eleanor? Well, they play on it a little bit. He's always sort of coming onto her and she's like brushing it away. I think he's supposed to be a bit younger though, isn't he? <laughs> well... But still legal. We're not suge- <laughs> we're not suggesting that Eleanor's a paedophile. No. By any but she, he's always like, oh, let's go on holiday together. And they do eventually. Um, um, can I say, I did actually write down as well, it takes too long to get to the point. We don't even mention Atlantis until almost two-thirds. Mm. So towards the end of the second episode, so we're nearly like two-thirds through the story. It's crazy. Uh, what else have I written? Unfocused, too many ideas, not enough clear narrative. Um just because you can go anywhere and do anything, it doesn't mean you need to. Yeah. And that that's a lesson worth learning. No eight-year-olds following this. Well, they wouldn't understand what bloody well is going on, no. would they? No. Like, skip back to the very first one, you know, the one about the, that, the they, baby. They were just a bit more <laughs> traditional. Baby that was a that monster. That first one of the last series. The last series was all very straightforward, you know, adventure. They could have been TV episodes. There ain't nothing wrong with having a beginning, middle and no. end. And there isn't anything wrong. Listen to me, audio writers of the future, because I feel like <laughs> some of the big finished writers now suffer from this. There's nothing wrong with explaining what's fucking going on whilst it's going on, all right? Yeah. Okay, well, let's move on to the next one, because we're not going to get anything positive from yeah, here, It was a really... It was a shockingly no. bad it opener, yeah. and the weakest of this year, I think. Yeah. Well, next, we have The Power of Fear. We have Mark Katz and Wen. And Jeremy James joining the guest cast oh, this Jeremy time. Jeremy James is back. <laughs> Sorry, Jeremy. We don't not like you. It does a lot, doesn't it? You basically just turn up in everything. <laughs> <laughs> this was written by Steve Loins. Lions. Oh, this was written by... Loins is... Right, okay. The groin area. This was written by Steve Lyons. Yeah. And directed by Jason Hay. Ellery. Does he direct all of these? I think so. Oh, wow, Okay. I, I will confess, I think he's a, a brilliant producer of audio drama, and I think he's possibly the weakest director. Maybe there was have. no one available and you just had to fill in. Now, this was a good one, though. This was, I think, our favourite. The best My favourite. Oh, this season. The Power yeah, of Fear. Too right. A fun concept. So, set in like a fairground, haunted <laughs> house thing, yeah. basically, these aliens are, have crash landed. They're in this haunted house because they live off they need the the power of fear literally they're, they're they need people's emotion fear vampires. the emotions yeah so they're in this haunted. so they're thinking when people are getting scared and stuff they're gonna feed off this fear but obviously it's a haunted house people think they're just dressed up and are laughing and having a great time it's not working uh so that uh, so it's joke so is, much though, fun the, well though the joke is Steve Lyons has taken a good long look at the Tomorrow People and seen just how tatty and cheap this show is. So he's written an entire script around the fact that these aliens look tatty and shit. And everybody, nobody is scared of them and they need people to be scared of them. So they're walking around trying to scare people and people think they're just dressed up in a costume. Oh, it's so And we've got a great guest character of Mavis oh who Mavis is, is the star who really livens this up because she, she gets um she sort of gets involved with the tomorrow people in what's going on with the aliens she's everything. like she's hilarious she's basically like as if they drop Bianca from EastEnders <laughs> yes. into a tomorrow people episode you know Bianca yeah so coarse yeah. and she oh she gets the best lines there. so basically she's unimpressed by everything and she goes at one point are you one of those tomorrow weirdos? <laughs> <laughs> and then Ellen is trying to explain what's going on and she's had enough and she goes, oh, get out of my way, you daft cow. <laughs> <laughs> it's really good fun. She's dreadful. And she goes to the aliens. Um, they're wearing bubble wrap with half ping pong balls for eyes. And at one point she calls them. <laughs> 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 Squeaky voice Muppets. <laughs> And she gets lines like, are you a pervert? And it's great like because the Tomorrow people, like John and Eleanor, 
they're but, uh, so mainly serious. they're so serious and so earnest the whole time, whatever's well, happening. She's which serious. is their job is the character, no, no, I Maeve suppose. Maeve is serious as well, but she's just hilarious. But just up against in comparison to Eleanor and John. Yeah. She stands out even more. <laughs> when she knocks out one of the aliens, she goes, Stitch that Kermit. <laughs> um and I I think she's not supposed to be very likable. Like, because she isn't taking anything very seriously. But weirdly enough, she's yeah. the one that's getting stuff done in this. Because, you know, um, they're trying to scare everybody and she's the one that's sort of making them wake up to the fact that these aliens mm. look absurd. I think um, for a little while, we're supposed to think maybe she's going to be a tomorrow person. I was hoping she'd join them. Oh, she, they, they need a character like this. Mm. It's like Emperor Giorgio in Star Trek Discovery, the one character that takes the piss out of everybody and is a bit nasty. But towards the end of the story, unfortunately, she sells them out to the papers. And I thought, yeah, there's no going back from that. She's gonna, no. She's in trouble now. Oh, she was wonderful. And this features the last appearance of Philip Gilbert as Tim mm, from the TV series yeah. because he died after this. What so a one sad. to go out on, though. A really good one. Well, you say really good one. I don't think this is a popular one. I think audio. for fans of Tomorrow... So I, I, well, I, I found a review like... online. There was one review on the timescale. Mm. There's basically one person reviewing all of these on the timescales. And he said this was the worst one of all. But I think he's a Tomorrow People fan... And this really is taking the piss, not only out of the premise, but out of the production value. Is it like the, the Love show. and Monsters of Doctor Who? Yeah, you yeah. you basically have to be in on the joke. Yeah. And the cover's weird as well. There's this like vampire guy <laughs> on the front cover. That doesn't happen in the thing. Who? I don't know what happened with that, but Gary Russell, that John Ainsworth, if you're listening to this, who what, is, who that, is vampire that vampire? <laughs> because I don't think he's in the show. Well, I think he's he's in the haunted house, is he? Yeah, but it's not what the aliens look like, is it? Or do they no. pretend to look like that? I don't know. I have no idea. It's a very odd no. cover. Um, yeah, if you're going to like this if you don't mind something that's a bit meta and that is aware of the limitations of the TV show that inspired this. Mm. Um, if you are, like we said at the beginning, if you're a very serious geek without a sense of humour, skip this one because you just won't enjoy it. Um, I thought this was great. There was some really good commentary as well about human fears and about how we trivialize our fears by making movies and tv shows and haunted houses and things like that so there is some substance to this it's not just all sort of coarse jokes um I, yeah i thought this was super fun very witty lines ridiculous characters i mean these squeaky voiced aliens they they all sound like they've had a dose of helium don't they? They're hilarious. Hello. They're brilliant. Why I, are they not scared of yeah, us? I really like this one. <laughs> yeah. So um, th this is the, the the best of the year, yeah. it, as far as I'm concerned. This is the style of Tomorrow People that I I want. I'm not I'm not so bothered about the seriousness of the stories or the characters. I I prefer just an, a fun adventure like this. And it had a nice circular ending as well, where there was another race, wasn't there? Another race of aliens. Uh, called the oh, no, the ones that crashed. Hurrah, hurrah. The ones that crashed. They these were on the run from them. Yeah, but it turns out that um, the Harag that they were on the run from are actually scared of them. So they're actually in a perfect circular society because they need people that are scared of them. So they actually can live together in harmony. Right. I don't know if that makes any sense, what I've just said there. Something like that. It, the, it the, sounds like it ties up. The resolution of the story, it, it just came together very neatly. And happy fucking days. I understood what was going on yep, throughout me this. too. But I think that's because you had Mavis in there basically explaining. Yeah, she was the audience. For, in her own it? unique way. Loved, uh, brilliant. Bring, out, <laughs> bring back and when for more characters, please. No, I just want, <laughs> I just want the Mavis spin-off where she, where she turns up in everything. Sapphire and Steel, Doctor Who. Imagine her in Doctor Who. <laughs> Why are you pointing that sink plunger at me? What's wrong? <laughs> she'd see the side men and she'd go, oh my God, what's this? S&M? <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, let's move on to the next one. Yeah. The Curse of Kaven. Is that Kaven from the Space Pirates? I don't think so. Oh, okay. So this features Joyce Gibbs. Oh, who's Joyce Gibbs? She was in Dalek Empire. Series one. I remember when the Daleks came to Vega Six. Uh, I think I'm very good at doing that. She's you know? very good. Yeah. 
Nicholas Briggs, if you need anyone <laughs> to narrate... <laughs> Resurrect Joyce Gibbs. <laughs> your, you know, your inevitable f- fifth series of Dalek <laughs> Empire. I'm there. Uh, we've got Matthew Brenner. We've got Miles Richardson. Oh. We've got Michelle Livingstone, that wonderful actress from Sword of Orion. And this one doesn't feature Nicholas Young. So or this is, Philip Gilbert. Or Philip Gilbert, because he's dead. Yeah. <laughs> um, but Nicholas Young has uh, a week off. So this is the first Tomorrow People with our original characters. This is Paul the... and Eleanor. Only, Mainly Eleanor. Only Tomorrow Person episode ever to not feature John. Wow. And, I mean, when Helen Goldwyn got the script through for this, she must have... Like, she was like... This is my moment. <laughs> this, this is, is her moment. She's like, I'm, I'm here. I've studied. I've done time. my one woman show. <laughs> I am ready. I can do this. I'm going to be the star of this tomorrow for people. I'm on the front cover. I am here. Are Helen making... Goldwyn as Eleanor. I can do it. Are you making a direct comparison <laughs> between Helen Goldwyn and Martine McCutcheon? <laughs> huh? Helen Goldwyn is so much more talented. Oh, can we say it as a complete oh my God. side note? Yeah, we saw her... Um, her one-woman show. Helen Goldwyn, not Mike McCutcheon's. On YouTube. Oh, go and find Helen Goldwyn's it's YouTube channel. It's fucking hilarious. She does, she's in like... I mean, she's in a little pub, I think, doing this show. And the audience is quite near... Like, she could spit on them, they're that close. <laughs> but she's doing all these songs to entertain. I mean, I wouldn't want to sit in the front row because she's doing, like, some rude songs in it, isn't it? She's like, bend me over in the kitchen. Uh-uh. No, 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 no. No, no, no. Right, right. <laughs> and stuff she like does, that. She does a whole so song. Funny. She does a whole song <laughs> where she's basically talking in innuendo for hours. She goes, this is what I like to do of an evening. And then she sings a song. And it's all sexual references yeah. without actually making a single sexual reference. Yeah. It's hilarious. It's brilliant. Um, and annoyingly, we discovered that this week, her one-woman show was on in London, and we only found out about it the <laughs> day know, after. I can't believe it. What a coincidence. We just happened to be watching it. We would have gone, though. Oh, my God. I would have gone. I'd love to have seen her. She can do it all. She is, like, just... She can do a one-woman show. This I have no doubt about it. This is a special request to Helen Goldwyn oh. to extend your one-woman toast. You should bring it out on her CD. Extend your tour, please. <laughs> yeah, tour everywhere, and we we'll want to see it. you. Because, like, jokes aside, she can do it all. I mean, she's you know in Doctor in the Pirates. Jokes aside, I'm going to be serious for a second. You're being sarky. I'm being Comedian. serious. She's no, a, I'm not. She's a hell of a talent, Helen Goldwyn. She is. A I hell think, of a talent. I think she can write. I think she can I'm direct. Just, that's what I'm trying to I say. I think she can act. I think she can sing. And I want to see her one woman. She can show. do the whole thing. Yeah, she's great. Anyway, back to. Yeah, anyway, so she's got the script. Command. It stars mainly Eleanor, and she's got lots of psychic issues in this one, of course. <laughs> Uh, well, actually, here we go. It's Nigel. Can I ask you, Sorry, are psychic issues basically a metaphor for like puberty? I don't think so. Like periods? No, because she's having these dreams, thinking she's murdering people. But okay, this is Nigel Fares again. Yes. And this is genuinely, I was like, we've missed an episode here <laughs> yes. because you've got Paul and Eleanor on holiday, and then she's like, oh, I had this romance a while back with this lion man. And I was like, what? Is something out? We had a Warriors Gate crossover or something? <laughs> was that the guy that she was talking to through that painting been, thing in Atlantis? She's been shagging a pharaoh. I was like, did I miss a whole plot line? But I think it's just referenced off screen. Um, because then she meets the dad of that holiday romance, who is unearthing some Egyptian style tomb at the beginning in the prologue. Yeah. Um, so that she meets up with them. Then we've got this. Um, other couple, Miles Richardson and Michelle Livingstone, I think. Yes. But then the guy that she did have the romance with, he gets murdered, right? Yes. And then, but Helen Goldwyn, Eleanor, thinks she's murdered him because she's picking up all this psychic shit going on in her head. Yes. But she's not. And so part one was very, very confusing. It's the same thing again. We he's, just... <laughs> he's introducing a shit ton of ideas and characters and notions and tones and none of it coheres. And I thought we were in for another new Atlantis. But by sort of part two to three, it turns into a whodunit murder mystery. So I've got a suggestion that maybe somebody read this and went, look, this isn't making sense. And, and please, will you cohere this plot? Somewhere in the middle of episode two. I think the big problem is it's called The Curse of Kavan. And the first ep- the episode opens with a scene set in a tomb, which is how one uh, Tomorrow Person episode on TV opens, 
with them unearthing a sarcophagi. And so you're expecting this to be like a weird hammer horror story. Mm. It's not at all. It's a murder mystery. And it is clever because the curse of Cavern, it's not the thing he's unearthing. He's bitten by something in that first scene. It's like an insect bite. Yeah. yeah. And so he gets a disease, which is then passed down to his son. The curse of Cavern is the disease rather than whatever it is he's unearthing. It's a clever idea. Anyway, once the murder mystery kicks off and suddenly we've got all of our suspects, we know what we're doing. And from somewhere in the middle, probably about the half hour point to the end, I thought this was great. That's when we picked it up and we knew what was going on. People have been picked off one by one. Yeah. Is it Helen Goldwyn or not? (laughs) I wrote down in my notes, (laughs) Helen Goldwyn, stop murdering people. Hence the, get away, you bitch, and all this (laughs) stuff. (laughs) (laughs) She should perform scenes from this in her one woman show. Be amazing. What? The Curse of Cavan? Yes. Why? Because it'll be fun. She could probably do a song about the Tomorrow People. <laughs> I don't know. Um, and suddenly, you know, everyone's pointing the finger at each other. We're looking for alibis mm. and all of this. And what it eventually leads to in the climax is... I'm going to... Really it's very it. clever. Spoilers a, if you haven't heard it. Yeah. Skip forward five seconds. Four, three, <laughs> two, one. Joyce Gibbs is the murderer. Joyce Gibbs from Dalek Empire basically murders her own son because she thinks he's got this disease passed down from her husband. Um, so it's a mercy killing. And the reason they say, they say, don't they, whoever it was that killed her, he trusted that person because it's point blank range and they were quite close. Um, and she says, oh, I'm so sorry, my son. A bit Jenny Lairdish and, mm. and shoots him. And then the bitter irony is that they actually knew he had the disease and he was getting the appropriate medication for it. From Miles Richardson. So he was <laughs> so he was going to survive all along. So she killed him for nothing. Yeah. And it actually, that plays out in quite a moving way. And it wasn't Eleanor. She was just picking up some psychic shit, vibrations, yeah, sure thinking that. and having dreams that she was the murderer. I don't think that ever makes and sense. And it didn't. And she was like, yeah, it didn't. But it did give us a couple of yeah, cliffhangers. Yeah, it gave you yeah. basically the two cliffhangers. I murdered you, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Die, you evil bitch. <laughs> Which is fun. Um, so I think actually this does become a pretty but, enjoyable story. But I think that beginning is such a mess, part one. Yeah. I think you're totally lost by the time well, you listen and, to it. So and no this point. is the second story on the trot where they've given the aliens weird comedy voices as well. Oh, well, no, there's, um, they sound like the Packers in Bang Bang Boom. It was and the Packers, that. but yeah. it wasn't. They're like, hello, I'm the, I'm yeah. the, I'm the pixies. Again, like they've been swallowing down yeah. the helium. Yeah. Stop sucking on the helium. <laughs> and just give us normal voices. So, I mean, there was no... As you say, there's no John in it. I mean, he's not got no place God, anyway. Miss him. But there were so many other characters going yeah. on. Well, and uh, it's a brilliant cast as well. Everybody's yeah. well suited to their roles and mm. delivering. The only real duff note with the characterisation, I thought, was the couple... Uh, Miles Richardson and... Michelle Livingstone? Yeah. They're sort of portrayed as this couple that absolutely hate each other because it turns out that Michelle Livingstone's having it off with the the guy that's killed, Helen Goldwyn's ex. <laughs> yes. Not Helen Goldwyn. Uh, Ellen's yeah, ex. Ellen. <laughs> yeah. It's all very confusing. <laughs> but basically, the couple, it, they keep getting these sort of... Bit, and it plays out like some dreadful scene in Murder, She Wrote. You know, mm. with, with as dialogue as good as well. Um, but as a murder mystery, I thought this was rather good, and it has prompted me to suggest that we get shillings and sixpences, and the Wendley no- Wendley Moore's murder. What's that? What is that? Well, we, during the pa- during the pandemic, Nigel Fares did this series of sort of Zoom calls that people could jump in on, right? And it was an interactive murder mystery series. Was it starring Louise Jameson because oh. she's quite close to him? Ellen Goldwyn there. Oh, I hope so. Anyway, um, I think he's got form of writing murder mysteries. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, maybe not based on this. It was okay. It wasn't that amazing. Oh, no. I, I don't think I'd log into them Zoom calls, especially after this. this Only is... if Ellen Goldman was there. You logged into a Zoom call of Annika Wills' yeah, birthday. Yeah, but she wasn't... <laughs> She wasn't promising Excuse a murder me. mystery night, was she? No, she was flogging off tickets to sit with her on her birthday, charging a tenner. <laughs> Just raising a glass of bloody wine. Hello, everybody. Uh, anyway, let's go on to the next one. I'd after rather, 
I'd rather listen to the Curse of Cavan than attend Annika Wills' birthday okay. party. So the last release in this series is Alone. Oh. And joining the cast, we've got Mark Donovan. We've got India Fisher. India Fisher, yeah. And this features, you know, John back again with Eleanor and Paul. Written by Nigel Fares. Directed by Mr. Big. Jason A. Gellery. So he did all of them, yeah. Um, a bit of a mess, though, again. Oh, God. Oh, this was even worse. Oh, you thought New Atlantis was no, bad. No, this is better this, than New Atlantis. No, this it's was... Not gr- it's not great. It started but... off interesting because you've got Nicholas Young going into, like, a psychiatrist's uh, and he's saying, what's wrong and everything? And he's like... And it's implied that oh, the whole Tomorrow People thing is all in his mind and it's not real. That's and you're what like, I, that okay, is what I this there's a good be. hook. That's that a is a good hook. way to get it. But I will say every single genre TV show has done that. I thought this was going to be a take on Buffy's normal again. Same thing. She wakes up in an asylum and the fella tries to convince her that the whole Sunnydale experience was a series of delusions that she had after she had a breakdown when her mum and dad split up. And that's where Buffy the Vampire started. So that's a brilliant premise. And I think it's a brilliant premise here as well to have John be convinced <laughs> that all of this bullshit is bullshit. You know, I mean, look at it. You've seen the episodes. I could well believe that's a heroin-induced or Fraxoin-induced, <laughs> you know, dreamscape. But we don't go back to that asylum no. again until episode two. Because then he says, well, it all started with me and Ellen when we were looking for, oh, she's had a psychic episode again, so she feels like someone's breaking out or coming out or whatever, that guy. So is it more narration? So they're trying to find, well, then it goes into them going to this village to try and find this kid. And then you've got India Fisher as Therese, the psychiatrist. That is Therese, <laughs> Therese from the Tomorrow <laughs> People, not Therese from Neighbours. <laughs> so Therese is there talking to this Robert, so there's a lot of that, and then Paul is with some guy doing something else. I thought Paul had gone bad and had gone off again. I thought we'd missed the whole episode. Whatever Paul is doing, I could not tell. It's cut back and forth with Paul doing something with some guy. Honestly, it was a week ago that we heard this. Oh, I can't remember Paul's storyline at all. And then it concentrates on this Eleanor trying to find this kid with Therese. And and basically, at the end of the day, what it is, is this kid has found a spaceship underground with this alien in it. The alien is feeding, needs to feed off people's dreams and dreamscapes. So John and Paul, for whatever reason or however they got there, they're in these underground things and it's all they're living in these dream things. So Paul, whatever he's doing, running away from aliens with that man or whatever is all fake. John's thing, sitting talking to the psychiatrist, is all fake. And this kid has been going down, visiting this alien, making sure people have dreams and stuff so that this alien could live. But then it becomes this sort of codependency thing where actually he's trapping the alien and he needs to let go. And he, and I think this is where the alone comes in because you've got the alien who's alone, you've got the kid that's alone, and then you've got this other subtext of John, if he wasn't a Toro person how he would feel alone so that's quite nice that it's called alone <laughs> with all those things going on but it doesn't really tie up it neatly is every terrible cliche imaginable every single mid-90s star trek episode ends in two ways yeah one of two ways either it was all a dream or it was all the work of a lost little alien boy and this has both of those endings i couldn't believe it it's basically like the crossroads ending. It was a dream all along. Oh, fuck no. off. India Fisher's great because she always is. And she's playing India Fisher. Well, she's trying to play sort of like an adult in this. Isn't she? I know she is an adult, but Charlie always comes across she's, as about what 12. What did she say again? Old. Get off you bitch or something again. Yeah, she's become a right cynical old bitch. That's it. That's <laughs> um, this does have, again, a kernel of a brilliant idea in it. So the idea that a tomorrow person could break out and then be taken by doctors. And obviously you're spouting all this bullshit about spaceships and <laughs> the next stage of human evolution. And they think you're schizophrenic. So they start putting you on medication and lock you up and put you in a padded cell. 
that's a great idea and it just touches on it and i'm like that inter- that idea is so much more interesting than dream machines and, and like, lonely aliens a train coming down a tunnel after them but it's not real because it's yeah. a fake oh, oh there's water someone had water after them because they couldn't swim so basically essentially yeah it's a load of confusing stuff and then it's all a dream all but along it's not interesting to follow that's the problem i'm what? just confused because i'm like what's happening i want to know what's going on i want to know if it's real or not and it doesn't go anywhere and then you finish it and you're like well half it wasn't real what's no, the point none of, of it was that? real no so it's not fun to listen to and the ending's lame oh not good no. not good at all and when you've got a couple of such striking ideas in there that you could have played about with just simplify these bloody things I I don't know who's script editing these, but somebody needs to say you've got too much going on for series three. I realise series three has been recorded and out now for two decades. <laughs> so you're not going to listen to my advice now. But please, for series three, I hope somebody between seasons said, look, let's go back to the simpler storytelling of series one. Like, we've got something here, but let's just tell engaging stories. So if you see this one on eBay for, like, 30 quid, because they all go in for some <laughs> ridiculous prices, leave this one alone. No. You can <laughs> Maybe pay 30 quid power, for the Power of Fear. Power of Fear. Yeah. Maybe bid on that one. Um, but even that, the I'd say, some money on that. that's an acquired taste, and we like that because we basically laughed at the TV show. Whereas if you're, <laughs> if you're a huge fan of the TV show, then maybe not. No, you're not going to. Maybe no. maybe avoid this season. So it's a bit of a disappointing season overall. It wasn't as fun as I thought. No, it does. It because, great idea, like you say. There's great ideas somewhere there. It's just the execution isn't. But always... because there is lots of different stories being played out in this season: the murder mystery, the dream machine, um, the, the fear meta comedy. It still it goes to show there is a lot of mileage to be taken in the, in this series. Like there's a lot of things they could do with it. It's just not done particularly no. well this year. It's really, it's quite a shame after the first year. And now we'll go back to it and I'll be like, basically, they've got to work very hard to impress me <laughs> yes. now in this series. But we do have some n- new writers in. Nigel Fez is in there, but there's Kevin Scott and Mark Wright in there as well, writing a part for once. So that should be quite interesting. But yeah, not great. No, it's a shame. Not great. I Don't introduce this to your kids guys right. put on no. the first series for him because yeah. that was a lot better from the first series yeah there we are well it'll be a while till we get back to them anyway i'm just pleased helen goldwyn was getting a lot of work oh helen goldwyn she had a starring role yes yeah. she and she's miles better than kimmy schmidt from, <laughs> yes from the she TV is show. she is she can do anything who is kimmy schmidt i don't know you keep saying that name i think her name was kimmy something who played carol and kimmy schmidt but it's a tv show about the woman who's down the nuclear bunker I don't know what you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, no, there's a woman. She's down in a nuclear bunker. A man's convinced a load of women that the whole world's gone to rack and ruin and the nuclear bombs have all gone off. So they go down into this nuclear shelter, <laughs> this harem of women, and then they realise it's all a con and they come out 10 years later or something and they have to readjust to life back on Earth, but they're 10 years out of date. And Kimmy Schmidt is one of those girls. Look, if it's not a film starring Helen Goldwyn, I'm not interested. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and she done films. Well, she could do that film, I'm sure. Has she been in any BBVs? I don't think she has. She's not that ilk. Oh. Well, I just would like to say, Helen, even though we are <laughs> no, we do, terribly it. mocking, um, <laughs> that if it wasn't for Lisa Bowman... She's done a Christmas song. Yeah. If it wasn't for Lisa Bowman, you would be our queen of Big Finish, because yeah. I think you are so talented. She's just been pipped to the post there. It goes, Lisa Bowman, Helen, Helen Goldwyn, Goldwyn, India Fisher. Then maybe Jacqueline Rayner. Uh, oh, Jacqueline Rayner's in there as well. But presiding over them all, Maggie Stables. Okay. Yep. Oh my God, the women of Big Finish. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, right. Well... Beth Chalmers. You're not even, you're, you don't even rank, all right? <laughs> so, we we'll go back to Doctor Two next time. Pleased oh, to know. Yes, back to the main range. Back to the main range. Yeah. So, we will be talking about Creatures of Beauty. He's got a knife! He's got a knife! Ah! <laughs> ah, beauty, beauty, no. beauty, 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 beauty. Uh, Project Lazarus. Oh. Ah! She's dead! Doctor, you can't solve everything with a piece of chocolate cake! <laughs> and flip-flop. 
<laughs> oh, I am an old flemmergy. <laughs> we'll nip back and quell the quarks. <laughs> <laughs> On the spaceship Pinto. Um, so that'll be a fun three to do. And we'll be asking for comments from you big Finnish hoes. Oh, no. Get your Finnish big hoes. Yep. <laughs> uh, especially the biggest hoe, Luke Malloy. Yes. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I can't wait. And in the meantime, don't forget to... Finish, finish big. big. <laughs> <laughs>